Welcome to Red Ice Creations Radio. My name is Henrik Palmgren and this is Internet Talk Radio, recorded from the west coast of Sweden. You'll find us online at redicecreations.com, where we have a new show for you every Thursday and Sunday. And our entire archive of regular shows is up there for free. And uh, if you like the show, we have a lot more programs available for you in the subscriber section. So uh, take a look at that. Thanks to Kent Daniel Bentkowski, who was with us last week talking about Stanley Kubrick's Eyes Wide Shut. Very good stuff. And uh, for our subscribers, we dived deeper into the global elite. We also talked about the TV series 24 and uh, about nukes going off in the US and much more. So check that out if you missed it. Today we have Alan Watt back with us for his monthly visit and we'll begin to talk about the origins of socialism and communism and uh, we'll get into the occult aspects of this apparently atheistic political ideology. What is behind the hammer, the sickle and the star? Stay tuned, lots of good stuff coming up with Alan Watt. Welcome. Today we have researcher Alan Watt back with us on the line. Alan joins us the last Sunday of each month here on Red Ice Creations Radio and we are very proud to have Alan with us. His website is cuttingthroughthematrix.com where you can follow along with Alan's blurbs and uh, very powerful audio commentary and I suggest you do check out some of his books, his videos that he got, he got available through his site. Alan is very knowledgeable about history, mythology, fraternal or orders, secret societies and all kinds of movements directing and guiding our world today. So uh, again with that let me say welcome back to Alan and thank you so much for t- taking the time to be here today. That's a pleasure, yeah. It's awesome to have you. Uh, you know I, I I thought we could dive in today to kick things off talking a little bit, uh, a little bit about socialism and, and communism. I I heard one of your blurbs where you kind of went into a little bit about the symbology behind the uh, the Soviet flag and all of this and maybe we can dive into that a little bit later on but uh, to get things going um, I, I guess we could start at the at the official beginning to kind of uh, unravel some of the knots that uh, there. Do, do you think that you know Karl Marx, Frederick uh, Engels uh, are are these guys the real founders of of communism? No, no. The uh, we know that Karl Marx was uh, a hack journalist who was kicked out of Germany and brought into Britain to basically write the manifesto. Uh, he was so unimportant that for many years uh, his name wasn't even attached to the first couple of editions. <laughs> so he wasn't the, the the main thrust. He was the person who was told what to put into writing, into a form, a formula really, uh, and a theory, the whole theory of dialectical materialism, and to make it into what seemed to be a science, and that was what it was meant to be. It was to rev- uh, to rival existing religions by adopting the the same sort of beliefs as religions run on. Hmm. There was the inevitability of what they call progress and the rising of um, uh, new forms, new ways of living from the lower classes, struggle supposedly. Mm -hmm. Uh, And as as the decadence set into the middle and upper classes, then then you'd always have this fresh input for a new direction coming from the workers, which was nice on paper but never happened in reality. Hmm. So it was a, it was a, a pseudo science which tied in heavily with the writings of Charles Darwin. Yeah, it was based on the, the Superman type theory that through science, through uh, through the abandonment of all religions and and simply using science, man would somehow fulfil a destiny, which shows you that there was a religious pull to the whole preaching of communism, that there was a destiny there to even fulfill. Mm, yeah. um, and that's when that they, they wrote many books. Um, you'll find that all the Masonic, the Freemasonic groups of the day were heavily involved in the revolutions, which predate, predated Karl Marx. Hmm. Uh, you can go back to the, the English Revolution. That was the first major turn where bankers financed Cromwell uh, to take over England and get what they call democracy 
on the go established. Uh, Second revolution mm-hmm. was the American Revolution, and um, and then of course that was followed by the French Revolution. Yeah. So pre pre Masonic literature, even today, openly declares that they have been behind every revolution for the last five hundred years. Uh, uh, regarding Cromwell, what what uh, time period are we talking about there? You're looking into the into the the 1600s. Okay, yeah. And uh, Cromwell was financed by bankers uh, from Amsterdam. Yeah. Who financed his army, the equipment, uh, the armaments, and all of that kind of stuff to 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 change England's system from the feudal society. Uh, to the next step, which was a form of democracy, even though initially it was all for nobility, really. Hmm. They, they, they swapped their feudal system and gave themselves a parliament, you might say. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I guess we could tie this into, um, I guess, William of Orange and the bank system coming out of uh, the Netherlands, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah so that, that, that was heavily, heavily involved. <coughs> and uh, as I said, if you're on the go much earlier, you'll find that with uh, e- even the writings of um, of Moore with his Utopia. He wrote Utopia about the same time, uh, or just before um, John uh, Francis Bacon wrote his New Atlantis. Mm, yeah. They're very, very similar because they're both Freemasonic writings or, or Rosicrucian writings. Hmm. And they talked about a future world where everything would be in its place and everything would have its place, uh, run on a form of science with lawyers at the top as well, administering the justice to the people. Mm-hmm. Um, but basically science would lead the way out of the darkness of religion. Yeah. Hmm. So from the 1500s onward, you might say, you can see the start of this. And by New Atlantis, they meant uh, the Americas. Yeah. That's what they meant. By the, by the New Atlantis. That's an an, an interesting idea. I want to want to return to that uh, a little bit later, also maybe. But uh, uh, regarding the you know I guess revolutionary m- movements, um, w- one theme uh, theme I guess is running throughout all of this is uh, the tie-in with with the um, with the Promethean character. Uh, isn't this right? Mm-hmm. Um, this. Of course, is a statue that is, uh, I guess, w- outside of uh, the Rockefeller uh, Plaza or what is it in <laughs> New York? There, where um, this is basically the god who stole um, th- uh, the fire from from the other gods, right? That's right. For fire from heaven. Yeah. Meaning intellect. And uh, there's a good poem out there by Shelley on Prometheus, uh, is, is well done. And Prometheus again in the in the later religions became uh, Satan. It's the same hidden meaning behind all the religions. In fact, they're all the same story. Mm-hmm. So Prometheus took light, intellect, to the world of darkness and gave it to man. Yeah. So so he's the again the the rebel who defines the the over overlord, I guess. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> and 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 again the re- the revolutionary idea then is to to kind of always rebel against the authority to kind of i guess that they see it in the in the way that they are trying to you know rearrange the the current paradigm by actually having people uh rebel or 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 you know go in revolution i guess yes yeah the whole, the whole idea of the mystery religions uh, is to bring order out of chaos yeah and they perceive a world where everyone do, does their own thing as chaos, as chaotic. They want a world run by science, where science dictates to the people, and the people follow and do what they're told. Yeah. But, but this has been like that from, for at least 500 years. Hmm. And we see it today where, where uh, on all television programs across the globe, uh, even on regular little newscasts, they always bring experts on to tell you what to do about this, that, or the other. Mm-hmm. You don't have to think for yourself because they're there to do it all for you. Sure, yeah. And that is what Bertrand Russell, a lord, he was a British lord, mm-hmm. yeah, a hereditary lord too, um, said, he says, we're creating a world 
where the people will be unable to decide anything for themselves. They'll simply follow uh, the experts, and that's the world, the utopia they're talking about. That's what they mean by order. Yeah. It's a planned future. Yeah. Um, we we mentioned earlier, uh, you know, regarding the English English uh, Revolution. C- uh, do you know anything about uh, Guy, Guy Fawkes? Oh, Guy Fawkes. Yeah. yeah. Well, Guy Fawkes um, uh, supposedly was brought in, and many think at the time because of the chaos that was reigning when James the First of England came in. Mm-hmm. He was already the sixth of Scotland, but the first for England. Um, he needed um, an excuse to get uh, taxpayers' money to build his armies up. He couldn't find them, and it was lucky that the ta- that Guy Fox had been brought in on behalf of uh, of some of the Catholics, and I thought it was an early Jesuit training he, that he had. Hmm. And somehow or another, um, they, they did catch him red-handed. They planted gunpowder underneath the Parliament building. Yeah. And so uh, James became the victor there, and suddenly was a hero, and he got all the tax money that he wanted, etc. <laughs> so, um, the, uh, is, do you know if this is related, and uh, to uh, the, the huge London fire that was raining in? I think it was, wasn't it? Uh, 1666 this was right yeah that's right you always have three sixties in major events yeah <laughs> and uh, yeah the, the, what's interesting too that see at that time uh, Sir Christopher Wren and other architects uh, who were also Rosicrucians very high level Rosicrucians just happened to have a, a new plan of London all, all drafted up yeah with new buildings, uh, and of course that would have lain idle if they didn't have the fire, so it was very fortunate they had the fire to fulfill the dreams of rebuilding London, <laughs> an international city. Yeah, uh, it's a, it's an amazing day, it, it kind of, it's so obvious, uh, you almost bypass that event sometimes, it feels like, <laughs> I mean, mm-hmm. it's, uh, it's amazing, and I, I get, again we can, I guess, tie this into, you know, the, the fire worship of, of Prometheus and the again the the idea of the yeah. the sun worship or the the fire that changes society to to bring forth this new new order. Do do you know if uh, if there are uh, you know in other um, cities and so forth there are major you know astronomical alignments going on and there are um, city plannings and all of this. Do you know any of that uh, going on in in uh, London, the city of London? Um, I'm sure it will be because these guys love it. They never, they never change their methods. They always stick to the same methods. And sure enough, I mean, you'll find that the major cities along the eastern U.S. seaboard, if you line them up, yeah. uh, the major ones all go in a straight line across the curve of the globe, uh, all the way back to um, Stonehenge. Mm, yeah. For instance, that's no coincidence. Yeah. Uh, they love to, to... You see, in the, in the ancient times, uh, in ancient Egypt, uh, there were the stellar cults who studied the stars and the movements of stars, and you had the sun ones who, were, who, who watched the, the solar movements and the moon, etc. Mm-hmm. And they already had it all mapped. They knew when eclipses would come. They knew that the Earth was round. They knew that the Earth traveled around the sun in ancient times. Yeah. And... Uh, they loved to, what, what they said in Egyptian writings is that they would bring heaven to earth, they'd amalgamate the two. And so what they did was they would build their big temples and in the shape of the constellations with the other constellations in alignments with them. Yeah. And if you take the constellation Orion, that was the hunter, and every pharaoh was given the title of Orion or the hunter. Mm, yeah. And he was also given the, the, the title in the Greek at one point of, of Adonai or Adonis. Yeah. And uh, so the different names for the same warrior. Hmm. And uh, the, the three uh, of the, the three stars of the belt of Orion became the three pyramids, the great pyramids. Yeah. Hmm. And they also built the rest of the, the, the there's other buildings in the, from the from the satellite photographs. You'll see the whole of Orion recreated on Earth. And so they've always used the same strategy down through the eons yeah. and the, the secret brotherhoods to to bring heaven and earth together by recreating heaven right here. 
and that's that was the beginning of the plan for utopia. Mm, interesting. So the alignments are very, very um, essential to them. Yeah. And they go along ley lines, etc. We know that the Catholic Church, when it came in to, to Britain, uh, initially they used to knock down the old temples, then an order came out from one of the popes, and he says, no, ju just to reconstruct them and change them into pagan, to, uh, to Christian temples. Yeah. And they are all on ley lines. You can actually see the the uh, the, compass, the, the, the the satellite photographs once again. You'll see how they're, they're all in alignment with each other in Glastonbury and all this kind of stuff. Hmm. Uh, this is common knowledge. They came out in the 1800s, a big time. Yeah. And, and then now, of course, there's plenty of evidence to support this. Um, the recreation of heaven on earth, but a utopia run by those in the know, the scientists and the brotherhood to make the perfect system on earth. That's what they mean by that. Um, do you think that, you know, they can... Um, could could there circulate ideas up there that, you know, on these levels, I guess, uh, of, of these people who actually are in the positions of power to actually build cities and so forth, that, you know, they actually are communicating in some sense with, you know, higher forces with these kind of messages that, you know, we, we got the idea or something like that? Well, they put out a lot of nonsense. See, most of the stuff that comes out about these groups comes from these groups. Yeah. <laughs> And they always give us stuff to mystify us and intrigue us because mm. it's it's like um it's like many of them have said uh, even about the Illuminati uh, uh, the, the Illuminati said that um, the best way to get people into the order is to put out mystery and intrigue. Yeah, yeah, sure. And the young go in, you see, they want to know the secrets, so they put a lot of nonsense out there. We do know that that some sects of them have used channeling, mm -hmm. uh, we now call channeling, yeah. for centuries. In fact, you can go back to the ancient Greeks, where they would use, um, uh, especially their oracles, their main oracles, they would have women who were essentially drugged, mm -hmm. uh, who were supposedly in communicado with the gods, and she would murmur something in a strange tongue, or just a garble, and the priest would interpret it. Mm -hmm. That was very common in the ancient world. Mm -hmm. So they've used, and it's generally women they use for channeling, uh, even Adolf Hitler and, and the uh, couple of his societies that he had, the Viril Society was one of them. Yeah. Uh, they used a, a female channeler, and, and again, we don't know how much is myth and how much is meant to fascinate us, um, but they, they do claim that some of their advanced technology was channeled through this woman hmm. for, for their weaponry. Interesting, you know, I I totally agree. It's it's a it's a jungle basically, a mishmash of all, all of these different ideas. And uh, and on one level, as you say, it's very intriguing, very interesting, and 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 also uh, I, I totally agree. It it feels like it is there to kind of mesmerize you and kind of get you into the the that kind of thinking or that kind of yeah. theme. I mean, uh, how how do you uh, do you, I mean, do you go by heart, or do you do you study this very meticulously in in order to kind of you know separate the the, the truth some from the uh, from the lies, basically? Yes, yes, you can. Uh, you, you can definitely uh, throw a lot of the mystery out the window because, as I say, they they put out about themselves generally mm -hmm. um, to get themselves uh, almost. A, 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 it creates awe in the listener to think, oh, they're so powerful and they have this magic, etc. Yeah. So you realize, no, they run ma mainly on science and money, of course, big money. Yeah. And um, and secrecy, and they are the only ones on the planet who are directing the course of the future of the planet. Yeah. So um, the the lesser groups, the, the lower orders of Freemasonry, can really believe as they wish. I knew that some of the middle members, like Maurice Strong, who was picked up by Rockefeller and has been a UN frontman ever since, mm -hmm. uh, I know that he uh, has his personal deity that he, he uh, meditates with. Um, <laughs> now, how much of that is nonsense or he's put on a show for the public, once again, we don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Very interesting. Yeah, it, it, it always also seems to tie back to these, you know, entities that are being channeled or whatever. I mean, we could speak about, of course, 
uh, Alistair Crowley and his, you know, I was where you got the the Book of the Law. We could speak about, um, I guess it was Joseph Smith of the Mormons who also had some kind of encounter with light beings or something like that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and, and once again, Joe Smith was a Mason. Yeah, yeah. And uh, fortunately, the angel let him translate it all. He said, gave him the power to translate it from the golden tablets, then took the tablets away so that there's no proof. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, it's it's beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, uh, regarding, um, you mentioned the, the, the Nazi, the, the real society, and, and I guess also the Thule society. And there, there is this uh, underlying theme that, that there was some kind of, you know, fight between the, the Nazi branches and uh, them going up against Freemasonry and the you know the uh, the the fraternities that that were in place uh, in Europe throughout the, that time. Do you, do you know if this is true? In in uh, yeah, what what is t- this is this the, a standard thing? The Soviets did the same thing. Mm-hmm. Um, they once they get in power, they abolish all lower orders of Freemasonry because they of all people understand how Freemasonry has been used to foment revolution and counter-revolution. Ah. <clears throat> so they always abolish the lower orders. However, while they're in power, they keep the higher level to themselves, and they still practice it in the higher level. Hmm. I mean, if you, if you look at Himmler, mm-hmm. Himmler had his own Masonic uh, Knights Templar type uh, temple created and built. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he, he went by the old Templar plans with the round temple, or, or octagonal, I think some of them are octagonal, mm-hmm. but um, so yeah. he was heavily involved in this, more so than, than any of the rest of them. Yeah. And we know that Adolf Hitler had his, fav- his favorite channeler as well, uh, and he also had um, a, a guy who did the stars for him, his horoscopes. Mm-hmm. So he was heavily influenced by all this, too. Hmm. Uh, the Soviet regime, it's interesting, in the British newspapers, after they decided to take the walls down, because it was time to move out into society, really, Yeah. Uh, according to the speech by Gorbachev that he gave in the Soviet Union, um, it, interesting enough, a two-page spread was done on the Soviet uh, general staff of the military, and they found that they were all into the same things, channeling, fortune-telling, Hmm. talismans, all the old magic stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, there is this, um, you know, underlying idea, the the official version, you know, uh, just as you said there, that, you know, the the um, the Soviet or the, the communist socialistic idea was, you know, uh, atheistic in, in that sense. But, you know, I think you pointed out in in one of your, your blurbs that again this is very you know a very religious movement. Um, I, I guess c- could we interpret something is if we um, look at the symbols on on the on the old Soviet Union flag? I mean the hammer and the sickle. What what's your take on that? Well, on you, the one hand, you you got the hammer, which is more of a Nordic. You see, behind all these these movements, you always have a Nordic influence. Mm-hmm. And so you have the hammer of Thor. And the, you also have the same hammer in the British societies um, The H.G. Wells belong to, um, the Fabian Society, where you, you will see on the stained glass windows for the Fabian Society, mm-hmm. uh, H.G. Wells and others, the founders, hammering the world by, with a big hammer. So that was the same as the Soviets, that you would use the hammer, the might. Yeah. But they also have the sickle. Now, the sickle is a standard tool that Kronos, Saturn, Kronos yeah. is the Greek for, yeah. for, for yeah. the same thing. Yeah. Um, he was called the side wielder. He, he, he cut the cords between ages, the old and the new, so that the scythe was a symbol of the cutting between the old and the new age. Mm. Um, and also just off between the horns of the, like the moon, it's also the moon, you see, the, the, the Nasi in Hebrew, it means means the head. Hmm. And it's also for the new moon, they call that too. Ah. The Sanhedrin is called the Nasi, which is quite the coincidence. So. <laughs> and uh, between the, the two horns of the sickle or the moon, mm. you also have a little star. 
star there if you look closely. Yeah, yeah, that's and That again is a star of Lucifer, the light bringer of Prometheus, same old story. Yeah. Uh, highly occultic. Then they had, uh, see, all Masons and military organizations have a square where they march. Mm -hmm. And that's from Freemasonry, and they call it square bashing in yeah. Britain, where you learn to drill and do all your marching. And the Soviets had the red square, yeah. and red was the color in Freemasonry for revolution, you see. Mm, yeah. Uh, it's quite interesting to see that. Uh, if you go to the British police, they wear the checkered one, the black and white squares around their hats. Yeah. Because they are Freemasonic societies, they are the fraternity of Freemasonry and, and all police forces. Yeah. So uh, there you have the one on the one side, and then you have the red ones on the other. But they're all part of the same structure. Yeah. In fact, the Scottish branch of the military on around their their uh, their hats, they have the red and white squares because that comes from the old Jacobean part of of their society, the Jacobean uh, revolution. Interesting. Yeah. So we are those same ones today because because Scots are always put out into the forefront uh, as the shock troops for all the fighting. So mm. they've got a lot in common with the symbology of the Soviet system. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, you mentioned a, a lot of interesting, um, you know, t terms that like the like Jacobinism and also the, of course the Fabian Society. Uh, um, maybe we can go into that also. But uh, there is one term I know that um, might also connect with with a with a hammer, and this is the idea of beating your swords uh, into plowshares. Have you heard about this? Yeah, <coughs> eventually <coughs> that was always their, their intention, but only after total dominance of the world is achieved mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to ensure that, that the Joe public could never have a counter-revolution. That's what they mean by it. So this is the, all, the, the, the idea of abolishing all, all weapons in the world after your, you know, your structure is in place, basically. Yeah. yeah. In fact, communism... Um, it used to say that the definition of their goal was the, the absence of all opposition. Hmm. That that was that's when they would achieve their goal. Yeah. yeah. And they ran with the uh, see they used all the Masonic free symbols in in the Soviet side as well. And Leon Trotsky wrote about it when he was escorted out of Russia. Yeah. He, uh, he was escorted through two or three different borders by Russian police, or, or NKVD, they were called at the time. Mm -hmm. And he said they didn't have to show passports anywhere because his guides gave Masonic flashes as they went past and they uh, allowed through. Yeah, yeah. And, and <laughs> Trotsky himself, when he died, he was writing a book on Freemasonry. He joined it while in prison. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they were all Freemasons on all sides. Yeah. And what's interesting, too, if you look into the, the United States... Um, uh, Congressional Hall, and uh, you, you'll see all the symbols of the old gods, the myth mythological gods of Greece up on the ceiling. Yeah. If you go into the Kremlin, you'll see the same thing. Hmm. So, I mean, this again, is, is this a tie back to, um, I, I guess, the, 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 many, the, the main idea now is, I guess, that all of this goes back to, to Greece, um, this time type of deal, but but do you think that they up there even tie this back further to Atlantis, as you spoke of earlier, considering the, the, the Francis Bacon idea with the new Atlantis and all of that? Well, on the one hand, we have to remember the whole idea of... Uh, he, here's something people don't realize, and it's, it's not too difficult to understand when you grasp the initial parts of it. You're dealing with a system... With a, the, who plans the future always, and always did. Yeah. Uh, and how clever to write your ending as the beginning of your holy books. Yeah. We must remember that uh, there's a lot of hidden allegories in Genesis, for instance, to give you the realization they're giving you the ending, they're giving you it as the beginning, but it's actually been reversed. Their goal is to, to recreate Adam and Eve in the one perfection of a deity, which is a hermaphrodite. Hmm. And, and, of course, if Adam was the perfect 
uh, image, imagio of, of the deity. It's a perfect sameness. That's what it is in the Greek, perfect sameness. Hmm. And yet they took the female eventually from Adam. That meant that he had male and female within him. Yeah. That's the part of the mystery religion. And what do we find today? The scientists are trying to create hermaphroditic beings for the future, which will be well-balanced, will obey, uh, there will be no quarrels, no male-female anymore as such, and they can just clone more and more of them rather than have births for them. Yeah. This is all part of stuff that's been written down by high scientific groups. And um, now, let's go back again even to the same technique of putting the ending at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Plato had been, he, he'd studied in Egypt for years, that's where he got his education. Yeah. He then, once he got into the high degrees, he did a circular tour, they still do this today. And he went to, to uh, what's now called the Holy Land area to be initiated into other degrees, and then he went to India. Yeah. <laughs> for, for, so this is the same thing, India has a big player in all of this, always has been, very quiet place, but a lot goes on there. <laughs> and Plato being a member of the mystery religion, knew this technique of giving you uh, something that happened in the past as a story, but for the initiates, he's telling you what their ultimate goal was going to be hmm. by giving you a story as though it happened in the past. Interesting. Very interesting. And, and yeah. even the name he gave for, for the, the, the predecessor and his family, he claims, and even hmm. that's tongue-in-cheek. We don't know if he was pretending or what. Hmm. But he said his name was Solon, so his soul is, is the sun. Yeah. And the Greek city, when they went into Egypt and dominated Egypt, the main city was Heliopolis, or On, in um, Egyptian. Yeah. So it was the son of On. <laughs> and, uh, and so there's, there's tongue-in-cheek allegory uh, and a story form for something which is to come. Yeah, it's a, and it's a... It's it's a loop of of history and mythology all mixed up, I guess, and they can, you know, tie in the knots where they feel necessary to kind of keep the same game going over, you know, millennia, I guess. And all we have by any other authors on Atlantis is the same little sketchy piece where they mention uh, that the Atlanteans were at war with with the, the Greek colonies. Mm. And they were overrunning them, and it was the Spartans who saved them. Yeah. They defeated the Atlanteans, and as it was ending, then Atlantis sank. Mm, yeah. We don't have any real stories except the ones that were invented in the 1700s, 1800s mm. by Masons to talk about higher technologies. That's when they put all these books out that were that had nothing to back them up. Mm. But the more they're repeated, the more it seems true, you see. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and... Uh, mm. Because that's all we have on, on Atlantis. Mm. And we do know that, that if you go into the Mediterranean, the Aegean Sea, um, you'll find uh, that they've excavated tremendous excavate, excavations on the island of Terra, which is part of a, a, a ring of islands. Mm. And at one time, those, those, that they, were, they were the outer ring of an island that did sink. We know that is true. Yeah. We do know that, that the people who lived there lived, there were high merchants, they owned the ancient world's merchant routes, and uh, every room has hand-painted frescoes, ideal location, beautiful temperatures. They lived, they were the high-class peoples of their day. We know that the middle of the island sunk, it was a volcano, and they did get off. Most of them did manage to abandon it, plenty of warning that was happening. Hmm. And that seems to be the, the, where the story of Atlantis really came from. Um, and if we are to take the again the the, <coughs> the mirror loop kind of idea about history and mythology, the the destruction of Atlantis obviously again then is going to be mirrored in the destruction of America if that is yes. the new Atlantis. That's right. Um, and in one sense, I don't know if, if this is the case, if we can tie this in, but uh, since we began to talk about uh, communism, communism and, and socialism, the I, I guess there is a c kind of a current, you know, um, ongoing invasion from, you know, South America into North America to kind of merge the whole continent and all of that. Yeah. But wasn't this... Um, Okay, this might not have been Karl Marx who wrote this, but wasn't this one of the ideas that was brought forth by Karl Marx 
um, to kind of yeah, get... Yeah, he wrote that in Das Kapital. Ah, uh, yeah. And he, he, he said that a world would evolve if they worked hard enough towards it, where they would have a united Europe. Yeah. A united Americas and a, a, a far eastern conglomerate. It's now called the Pacific Rim region. Mm, yeah. Uh, so this was all worked out by the economists of the day. Um, the big players like John Stuart Mill and others were all heavily involved in the planning of this. Uh, the bankers, uh, Rothschilds, were heavily involved in it too. Mm. It was foreign policy, in fact, to them. And then they, they simply... What they do, you see, they have different special groups of high Freemasons. Yeah. Just like the monks. See, Freemasonry already existed within certain groups of monks down through the ages. And if you wanted to start your own order of monks, you'd have to get a charter either from the group you were already in mm -hmm. or from the Vatican. You know? mm -hmm. oh. And so what they, what they did was the, the, you'd have ones who dealt with healing. Now, if you were into the translation of ancient languages, you would start your own up and have a charter to do it. And then that order would, would specialize in ancient languages. Well, that's the same way it still works today. Hmm. within free, high Freemasonry. Yeah. And so they give you the order called the Royal Institute of International Affairs, and the American branch is called the Council on Foreign Relations. Hmm. Uh, they're still, they, they still don't publish, mainly, uh, their meetings to the public. Yeah. And I've got a videotape where this guy's introducing Brzezinski, and he says that, he says, this is one of the few public, uh, um, um, publicly available broadcasts we're giving out Generally, says we don't allow the public to, to hear our meetings. Yeah. <laughs> so here, then you find every politician who's worth his salt is a member. Every high journalist is a member. Every newspaper man's a member. Yeah. Every high guy in the military is a member. It's the whole system. Yeah. They're part of a secret society that claims it is non governmental. And they don't play politics. That is true. They make an agenda and they follow that agenda. Yeah. They don't play politics. So we, that's a specialized branch of higher masonry. Um, and the same thing as precursor was the group that Cecil Rhodes and Rothschild set, set up in Britain, mm -hmm. um, which became the round table, table group of Lord Milner, Alfred Milner. Mm -hmm. uh, that merged with the Cecil Rhodes Society, and they became the Royal Institute of International Affairs, and they were given a British Crown Charter to exist, like a license. Yeah, and they had this. So in, a, in, a, in a sense, working for the British government. Yeah, uh, uh, Rhodes uh, people who got Rhodes uh, scholarships, right? Like Clinton. Yes, and, and now, of course, many politicians and bureaucrats of all countries uh, are Rhodes scholars. They all go to Oxford for their training, yeah. get sent back to their own countries, but they're already sworn towards working selflessly towards world government. Yeah. How, how would you tie in? Uh, people like Hugo Chavez in all of this. Uh, any ideas on him? Well, you almost always have your, your, your oppositions, what appears to be oppositions. Mm -hmm. The public uh, who are living in the bottom level of the matrix, uh, uh, can clue in when they see a common enemy. One enemy. The bit is getting too big for their boots. Yeah. So the trick has always been the dialectic. You always give an opposition to the enemy knowing the public then will, will take sides. Because in the, in the mystical arts, you always need at least two sides to create conflict, and out of conflict you guide the change. Yeah. The synthesis. And, and that's how it, this has been done for thousands of years. In ancient times, they couched it in more mystical language, and, and they would say that, that uh, summer combats winter, uh, spring combats autumn. Mm. And so that because that had to be even more secret from, from the powers that ruled at that time. Today mm -hmm. they're more open about the technique, and probably Marxism came out more openly than any other group by putting this technique down of, of the eternal struggle, eternal conflict to the ultimate goal. Yeah. And mm -hmm. you see, once in communism, you start off with, with your, your, your thesis, And, and that's, that could be your, your front group causing pressure, mm -hmm. knowing that, that for every act, uh, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Yeah. So you, you, you then create the, the reaction to it, <laughs> and you put your men in there 
for, leader, for leaders. Yeah. And then you have a synthesis, but it doesn't stop there with the synthesis, which is compromise. You've now changed the system to a compromise. Then you take the synthesis, and you start, that, that then becomes the new thesis, and then it has its, its antithesis, and then it becomes its, its synthesis again. It has to be never-ending until they reach their final goal of creating man as God. Yeah. For men, basically. Yeah. All going back to Charles Darwin, again. <laughs> and Darwin, all he was doing uh, was, was vocalizing his Masonic religion, because the Masonic religion had always believed in evolution. Yeah. And that with the use of science and understanding nature, they could speed the process up. Um, we had um, one uh, one uh, question f- for you, Alan, regarding you know, and I and I guess we could tie all of this together again in, in with the in with the the current situation in in um, in North and South America or America at large regarding um, multiculturalism and and how this is you know kind of being used. Do, do you think that this is ultimately is something you know damaging or or i mean is this also one of these things that are being played out to to you know further advance the agenda oh there's no doubt uh rockefeller gave a speech and i had the video of it it was taken internally at one of his meetings with his group of the cfr Mm. and right there he's they're talking about this and he says uh he said, it'll be unfortunate, he said. He said, you can't make an omelet without breaking eggs. Yeah. <laughs> and then he said, unfortunately, this generation are, are the cannon fodder for, for the plan. Yeah. In other words, they, don't, they know that the, the chaos that will ensue as people battle to try and retain their cultures and the animosity and hatred they will build up. But they will use all of that as a reason for coming down hard on everybody into a totally planned, directed uh, society. Yeah. That they will use that, so they're intensifying it, in fact. And you, you actually find that some of the groups that are coming up from Mexico and have been taught to be really radically uh, pure Mexican in Mexico forever yeah. and, and reclaim their old territories are being funded by the same Rockefeller foundations and Carnegie and Ford foundations. Yeah. To be so. So... These foundations, uh, like Adam Weishaupt said, uh, since they have unlimited financing, will control all conflicts and by financing all sides. Yeah. So I mean, uh, it, that exactly. Yeah, and, and so again, this is in to to bring in even more control and and uh, and. Uh, I know you wanted to elaborate a little bit further. We we spent another show previously talking about the microchip, but uh, again, you have some new stuff on this. I, I mean, this is um, being, uh, I mean, implemented, I guess, uh, as we speak. Or, or what's what's your? Uh, well, I'll, yeah. I'll tell you how it's implemented. I mean, at Loyola University, where they, they've had the world meetings mm. of science, uh, sponsored by the U.S. Department of Commerce. Uh, I, I have all of that material. 600 pages came out of that meeting. Hmm. And they say they have the chip ready to go. All they have to do is convince the public of the necessity of taking it. Hmm. And uh, and um, interestingly enough, I was watching a professor at uh, a university in Canada here mm-hmm. give a talk on the behavioral sciences. And he's a, a, he's a complete Huxley, and this guy believes in the, the writings of Huxley. Mm-hmm. And he was going on about um, the techniques of mind control through drugs, through electromagnetic radiation. Now, he didn't mention a harp, but that's what harp does too. Hmm, yeah. And how it can pacify people uh, and be used to control uh, whole societies. Yeah. Uh, as, a, as an actual fact, he wasn't surmising this is something to come. He said this is all proven fact. <laughs> So uh, this stuff is being used on the public today as we go through these big changes. Yeah. And they could make the public edgy, uh, uh, nervous, by a simple op- uh, alteration of the frequency, hmm. or they can, um, they can uh, make us very passive and willing to accept anything if they wish to. So they're using the harp technology in conjunction with the heavy aerial spraying, which is mainly metallic particles, Because years ago, uh, you probably heard of Nikola Tesla. Sure, sure. Well, there's an awful lot of rubbish about Nikola Tesla. There's been some sort of 
happy genius that wanted to benefit mankind. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, Tesla worked till the day he died uh, trying to perfect um, energy plasma weapons that could wipe out whole cities. He worked sure, mainly yeah. for the military. Yeah. <laughs> and um, he did uh, come up with the, the standing wave technology that's now called HARP. Mm. And the problem was that they couldn't use it effectively at very, very long ranges, only in, in immediate vicinities. Now, of course, they can bounce it off the ionosphere. However, it was the inventor of the, 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 the hydrogen bomb in the 50s, I think it was Hellier, who came up with the idea of how to get around that to use heart more effectively on whole continents or even the whole world. And he came up with the idea of heavily lacing the atmosphere from aircraft with metallic particles, which would make, make uh, the, 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 the atmosphere like a, a heavy circuit. And they could then use the harp technology to, to cover vast distances and regions yeah. and influence the moods of the people. Well, they're actually doing it. We're going through it. Huh. It's being done. Yeah. And, and it's right, up, right out in, in the open with, with this you know, latest uh, news that you, that you mentioned here. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, I mean, when will people wake up and realize what's going on? I mean, uh, again, if is it is it lost? I mean, if we if we are if they're implementing this stuff, I mean, this is contributing to the fact that people don't have the strength, uh, time, or energy to to actually look at this stuff. Yes, that's the problem. Plus, they've they've, they've had uh, the generation now is around twenty twenty five have been more inoculated at an earlier age, even with more inoculations than any other group. Mm. And we know the, the effects of the mercury and all the rest of the stuff they inject. Well, everyone's got immune system problems. Everybody today has, has it normally. Yeah. That's the new normal. And it's because they were attacking our immune systems, not helping them. Because you read the writings of uh, the guy who invented the polio vaccine, Dr. Sock. Mm -hmm. And we all think he's such a wonderful hero. And I went into his history and found that he was the, one of the main spokesmen for the American Eugenics Society, who wanted to drastically reduce the world's population. Oh That's in the history God. book. Yeah. And he <laughs> comes out as your savior, supposedly. <laughs> and then since then, our IQ level drops. Mm. And, uh, and we all have autoimmune problems. Now, this was part of the agenda. I hate to say it, but it's true. And so I think those who still re retain memory and, and uh, their intellect we're the last ones that they can speak out to, to alter the direction of this because the up-and-coming group have been too heavily hit. Yeah. And if you look at the writings of Arthur Kostler, K-O-E-S-T-L-E-R, mm -hmm. he worked at the United Nations in think tanks and laboratories finding ways to chemically lobotomize the public mm -hmm. for a world of peace. <laughs> and uh, I think, like, my God, they've been doing it. Yeah, yeah. And, and again, they've this actually been doing it. You know, the World Health Organization, mm. as part of the United Nations, in the 50s, they openly came out, and this is in the old newspapers and old books at the time, the World Health Organization, which I call Doctor Who, W-H-O, yeah. <laughs> uh, they came out and advocated heavily lacing all the water supplies in Lebanon yeah. to, to, to bring down the aggression of the people. <laughs> Uh, amazing. Great benefactor that the United Nations. Yeah, um, and and it's it feels like it, it is to also get people you know on this totally dependent on on uh, you know taking drugs to you know actually live a, a decent normal life at this point I guess. Well, Aldo Huxley was the main spokesman. Now here's here's something for you. <laughs> uh, the public broadcasting service here mm -hmm. are running a three apart special on a promo of a series for television on the year, I think it's 2020 or something, or 2025, mm -hmm. uh, run on fictional forms, but according to how society is going. And they all have brain chips. Everyone on the planet in the series has brain chips. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> and, and they take you through a guided tour of the future with, with the hologram of Aldo Huxley of Brave New World. Well, oh wait! I, I think I saw a piece of this. Uh, is it like the guided tour with uh, little children walking around? That's right. And yeah, I saw this. Yeah, I, I saw. And, and, and if you don't take your chip, they call you a luddite. <laughs> so you're fixed in time. You're all a caveman. 
Oh my and God. This is, this is called predictive programming yeah. of making us think this is inevitable and we'll just have to go along with it. Yeah, exactly, because if, if this is the expected future, again, if young people are so conditioned into that, it will be, you know, n- nothing strange at, uh, at all with that kind of behavior. That's that's how, how we work, basically, as, as humans. Sure. I mean, but what they're not telling you is we have never lived in a perfect society. We've never lived in a society where you do not have a dominant minority who run things. Yeah. Why would they give you access to a freedom? And, of course, they're not going to give you access to a freedom. Once everyone's chipped, yeah, they might give you the occasional virtual reality movie in your head mm. for a little while, but eventually they'll pull the main switch, and then the real purpose will kick in, and then they will have their utopia. Yeah. When we're all robots. <laughs> That's what their goal is. Yeah. Hmm. You live, history is a course through hell for people. <laughs> and we haven't suddenly become civilized. Yeah. I mean, there's also, in, in one sense, uh, if we are to look at it from another another perspective, this is incredibly rich learning process in, in, in the sense that we, you know, get to know our <laughs> dark sides very well during this process we're going through here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, we're all being conditioned. Uh, the, the, the youngsters, uh, as I said at that Loyola meeting, they promote this through movies and cartoons. Hmm. And the youngsters would want to be like their superheroes, and they'll tell them they'll get tremendous powers and how exciting it will be. Yeah. And now they're already they've got they've got movies out there already and cartoons for children with that very thing, hmm. where their heroes have microchips in their brains. Sure. So it's conditioning the public to, to this to go along with this. However, for the adult population, they need strife. They, they need to get all the different races fighting each other. Hmm. Uh, the chaos going the mass movements of peoples uh, all over the world uh, and, and the chaos that will ensue. Mm. Uh, so they can point out and say, hey, you can't go on like this. We've got to get order. We've got to have peace and safety. And this is, we have the plans right here to do so. Yeah. Do you think that this... First you create the problem, then offer the solution. Yeah. Do you think that this could be basically, you know, be erupting a, a, at any point here? Or, do, do you know, is there some kind of, you know big steps or big events that they have to, you know, get to before they actually, you know, implement the, the full the chaos. The problem is they have so many uh, facets mm. of the secret services in every country, which are all tied together at the top already, always have been. Mm. And especially since the signing of the, of the United Nations Charter and the NATO Charter, the CIA, the Mossad, MI6, and every other group is tied together in compartments at the top. Mm. And they have special groups that can create any kind of chaos and blame anybody. Yeah. So and it's all in there. They have unlimited financing. They have experts to do uh, the demolition jobs or whatever they choose. Um, we already have exposés from Port and Downs Warfare Laboratories in Britain mm. where they've, they've developed some of the, the most highly contagious forms of diseases to unleash. They can take their pick because they have it all. I mean, w- one thing we could, if if we're not fighting against, you know, um, mind control clones who are performing this kind of stuff, I guess one of our um, goals to to actually uh, do something about this then would be to wake up the people who actually are implementing these kinds of things, who are within the these structures and the, these power, you know, uh, these organizations, as you mentioned. Yes, uh, you'd have to. The problem is, I watched a program a few years ago. Mm on the American nuclear submarines that were based in Scotland, in the Holy Lock, and uh, the commander of the base was asked how they picked the actual men who were trained just to work the keys and the programs for the release of the bombs, knowing it was the end of everything. And he said, quite matter-of-factly, he says, we have a special uh, psychology test we give candidates for this particular job and what we're looking for are psychopathic personalities. <laughs> oh, my God. And that's what they've been doing with the scientists that work on this kind of stuff. And yeah. It's the same test they give them. They want psychopathic personalities <laughs> who live on ego. They have no, no feelings for other people, and they're obedient only to their, their paymaster. 
Listen, Alan, we're we're totally out of time in this segment. We have to keep the format here, but to to end things, uh, t- tell people about your uh, your website and some of your you have some DVDs and books available. Yes, they have to go into cuttingthroughthematrix.com and download whatever they want for free. There's lots there, lots of topics, and uh, there's also some DVDs and uh, MP3s for sale there and books as well. Uh, that keeps me going. So um, yeah, look in there and check for updates because uh, it gets updated pretty frequently. Yeah, check it out. Cutting through the matrix.com. We are totally out of time, but we're going to continue with Alan in our subscriber section. So we'll take a short break and be right back. Alan and I will continue in our subscriber section now, and we'll dive right into talking about the Priory of Zion, Plantard, the Knights Templar, and the Grail Hunters. And uh, this leads us into some fascinating areas about the latest DNA research, the Human Genome, or is it Gnome Project. We also talk about the elimination or the exclusion of the feminine and uh, the creation of life and the strife for eternal life. We also get into the recent news about the unearthing of the 1918 Spanish flu by uh, Canadian scientists. So I hope you join us in the subscriber section for much more interesting stuff. If you're not a subscriber, I hope you consider signing up with us. You'll get full access to our growing archive and at the same time you help keep this radio show and the website going. Thank you so much for listening to the show and thanks to Fredrik Pangren behind the controls. We will be back this Thursday diving into the creative cosmos with our good friend and regular Christopher Morse. So lots of good stuff coming up. In the meantime, stay tuned to RedIceCreations.com. Take care and we will talk soon. This is Henrik Pangren signing off. This is Red Eye.